we get, I mean, hey, everybody. <laughs> it's, it's me again. Um, and you're getting to the last part of the second day of the conference. You've got me, and then you've got uh, the fireside chat with Wayne Ting, which I know you all are looking forward to. And I have to be honest, this is actually my favorite part of a conference because people are a little bit sleepy from the night before and being out late at whatever party it was. And this is when it gets interesting because this is also when it gets honest. And so what I wanted to do uh, with the time that I have with you all today is to talk about something that I really want to be honest about. And that's how we take equitable climate action with micromobility. I want to talk about why it's so important to view micromobility and micromobility infrastructure as critical puzzle pieces for reducing transportation emissions. I want to talk about what we're not doing right now to expand it and what we should be doing to increase its impact. And for this talk in particular, because it's a small crowd of us, I want to set the tone. And I want to set the tone with this picture, actually. You all might have seen in the New York Times this picture. Has anyone seen what this picture is? Do you know what it is? No, nobody knows what it is. So in India, at the Ola factory, they have 2,000 women workers who are manufacturing and pulling together these uh, electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers. And I think this picture sort of encapsulate, encapsulates what I want to talk about in terms of taking equitable climate action with micromobility, thinking not just about the vehicles themselves, the infrastructure, but also how we pull uh, the pieces together. I'm not going to show up to a Micromobility America conference with Horace and not bring you all some numbers. So I thought we would start with some numbers just to sort of ground truth what we're talking about. A third of all global greenhouse gas emissions, so yes, that's right, a third, come from motor gasoline consumption. And that's our cars and trucks on the road. Motor gasoline consumption in the US alone is 20% of that total and 7% of overall global greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just at the national level, though. Even some states in the US, like California, where, where we all are right now, and Texas, contribute a greater proportion of emissions than the fastest urbanizing countries in the world, like Nigeria. So what are we doing about it? Well, in the US, I don't know if you've heard of it, but we passed two landmark pieces of legislation. So the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, I'm going to call it IJA, some people call it IIJA, and the Inflation Reduction Act. And between the two, there's more than a trillion dollars of funding to invest in electric vehicle charging networks, to invest in safer street design, bike and pedestrian networks, electric buses, EV tax credit incentives, and more. But the question is, is it actually enough? Is it actually enough to reduce uh, transportation emissions? And the answer is ish. Uh, my organization, so RMI, which is a global nonprofit organization focused on sustainability, focused on the clean energy transition, partnered with the Georgetown Climate Center on a draft yet to be published analysis that looked at how the Inve Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding mapped to 30 investment strategies that could reduce transportation emissions. And we put those 30 investment strategies into seven different buckets, which is the chart you see on the screen. And those seven different buckets, uh, and again, this chart shows the level of investment by bucket, are things like EV and alternative fuel incentives. They're things like highway expansion, whether we decide to do it or not. They're things like system efficiency, which really relates to traffic signals and how we make sure that traffic flows. Uh, to transit state of good repair, so how we take care of our rail, our buses, et cetera. Urban and inner city transit, which is around expanding the ways in which we move within and between cities. And then vehicle travel reduction, so things like changing how we do land use. What we found is that IJA, so the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, and uh, even coupled with the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act, in the 12 states in the US that contribute more than 50% of US transport emissions could, in a high emissions scenario, either increase emissions by 1%, or they could, in a very low emissions scenario, so this is if you did everything right, decrease emissions by 2%, and those are nationwide numbers. So to paraphrase, to paraphrase Gary Fisher uh, from yesterday, these results are squirrel nuts. They're not enough. They're not enough to be able to get to our climate action targets in transportation, certainly not at the US level. So what's the good news? And I don't, uh, for that matter, I want to make sure I'm not discounting that these really are landmark pieces of legislation. They're fantastic. They're fantastic for climate. They're fantastic for uh, infrastructure. They did a lot for electrification of vehicles. So 
the message to take away is not that. The message is actually something slightly different, which is that it's now going to be up to, at least in the US, states, cities, and private sectors to find the funding, to supply the funding, to put the funding in the right places in order to be able to get the emissions reductions we need. And the good news is that state departments of transportation alone have budgets that are seven or eight times more than the annual allotment of federal funding for them. So if state DOTs, if metropolitan planning organizations, which is another level of uh, governance in the US, if cities all decided to put their money in the right places, then we could have 7x, 8x, 10x the results that you're seeing on this screen here. And especially if we do five things. If we don't build highways, if we change our land use patterns, if we electrify buses and light duty vehicles, if we invest in travel demand management, which are employer programs for employees in order to get them into zero emissions mobility modes, and then, because it's so important, I decided to put it twice on this screen, which is change our land use patterns again. It's all about land use. I don't know if we've talked enough about urbanism at this conference. Probably not. Apparently, we talked about it more last year. But uh, changing our land use patterns and making sure we build housing in places that are already well connected, or for that matter, connect uh, places that are already uh, that already have housing, is incredibly important. It's the number one thing that uh, we should be doing just generally uh, for the climate and for transportation emissions reductions. So what does this all have to do with micromobility, and how does micromobility fit into this? And I mentioned that it's going to be up to states and cities and private sector to do the rest, to sort of foot the rest of the bill. The federal government has done what it's going to do. And the good news is, honestly, that states and cities are actually doing things, and they're starting to show results. Um, you all might have seen the states of California and Colorado are both putting in about 10 to $12 million for statewide e-bike rebate programs. The city of Denver, which is the uh, photo that you see here, created an e-bike instant voucher program that in its last cycle was fully subscribed in nine minutes. Nine minutes. Really? Like before that, actually, uh, it crashed the website. It was so popular. And so far, what they've seen is that a little more than 3,000 vouchers were redeemed. They were basically split between e-bikes and e-cargo uh, uh, bikes. Uh, the subsidies ranged from $400 to $1,700, so just to put that into perspective, I think everybody knows that the um, EV tax credit under IRA is $7,500. And uh, depending on what your income is, you can walk out of a shop with a bike, a helmet, and a lock for under $100. What I think is most interesting, though, is that the initial analysis of the data shows that owned e-bikes are not competing with shared micromobility options. And I think that's really important. Owned e-bikes are not competing with shared micromobility options. They're replacing cars. And anecdotally, the shop owners are saying that they're seeing 20% of the customers who are either selling their car or not buying a car because they're getting an e-bike instead. That's a big deal. It's a big deal because this is a single city and $12 million. It's a drop in the bucket. But what they're doing already is they're providing better and cleaner mobility options to people, especially at the lower end of the income spectrum. It's also important because, as we've heard from uh, McKinsey, while transit ridership, ride hailing, e-hailing, and car sharing, car sharing rather, haven't really recovered post-pandemic, micromobility has. And what I think is the most important thing is that the program is already showing results, even though the city of Denver hasn't measurably changed its network of protected bike lane infrastructure. But what if it did? Ryan and, and John, who are the authors of the uh, book Speed and Scale, which is amazing, say that building out a citywide network of protected bike lanes offers the highest return on investment for infrastructure spending for reducing congestion and cutting a city's emissions. And this is a photo of car-free JFK Drive in San Francisco, which, as I understand, was something meant to be temporary during the pandemic and was a battle to make uh, permanently car-free. So why aren't we building more bike lanes in the US? Well. We're not building bike lanes in the US, but that doesn't mean that bike lanes aren't, in fact, being built. 
And in Mexico City, thousands of people every Sunday get together to ride uh, down the Paseo de Reforma uh, during Ciclovia. We have, they have, not we have, they have uh, thousands of uh, shared bikes uh, through EcoBC. And they're doing all of this amazing protected bike lane infrastructure, as you can see here. Others are also investing in micromobility infrastructure. And what you see in this photo is a battery swapping station in Delhi for two-wheelers and three-wheelers, where across the city, two-wheeler and three-wheeler riders and drivers can go and change out their, their batteries. What it's going to take in the U.S. Uh, in order to get to the levels of adoption that we're seeing in India, where uh, just last year, so from March of 2021 to March of 2022, there were 430,000 EVs sold across the country. Only 4% of those EVs were cars and trucks. The other 96% were two-wheelers and three-wheelers, and manufacturers are saying that they're challenged to keep up with the demand for products. But again, what it's going to take in the U.S., what it's going to take in other places, is three things. So not just affordable access to owned and shared micromobility or dedicated public uh, micromobility uh, infrastructure, but also the political and the public will to fight for both. And I want to say those things are kind of the chicken and the egg. But I think the struggle the industry is having right now with profitability, especially for shared micromobility, is something that you all know, which is that not enough money relative to what's been invested in automotive incentives, what's in been invested in car-based infrastructure, what's been invested in car ownership subsidies, uh, not to mention the opportunity cost of owning a car, is really going towards either problem. We got penny on the, pennies on the dollar for micromobility in IJA and in IRA, and even in climate tech investments globally, which is the chart that you see here, Micromobility companies only received a billion dollars of funding out of the $58 billion total for mobility and transport last year. So I want to end uh, by telling a little story and also um, talking about when we put it all together, what does it mean? Like, what really should we be doing in order to make micromobility and micromobility infrastructure critical pieces of the climate action pu puzzle and, wh and what can you do? Um, it's almost hard to like talk about the pandemic as if it's something that's not still sort of happening. But when the pandemic first happened in Los Angeles, uh, it was, as probably it was in your experience as well, the first time I'd ever really experienced LA without cars and as ghost streets. And so um, within a couple of months, uh, my husband and I went out and we bought, privileged enough to be able to buy, buy bicycles and to start biking around the city. And it's amazing when you start biking around a city because you really rediscover it. You see it from an entirely different light, especially when there are no cars. There's sort of an empathy that you build, a sense of adventure that you have, and also at that time, a sense of sadness because there were so many stores and other things that were closed. At the same time as I was you know, trying to go out uh, on my bike, explore LA and just mentally recover from, from everything that was going on, I was working in the mayor's office in Los Angeles and we were launching programs, kind of program after program, trying to figure out how do we meet people's needs. Uh, so one of the things we did, like was done in Oakland and in other places, is launched a slow streets program, a sort of bottom up approach uh, to um, uh, having communities identify areas that they wanted to be closed off or made safer uh, closed off to cars or made safer for bikes so that they could bike around. What we found is that there, it was a completely oversubscribed program. Within a couple of days, we had 250 applications from community groups, sometimes even churches, that were trying to close off between one block and one mile of space. And they were distributed across the city pretty equally and pretty evenly. Um, and so there was this sort of movement towards uh, being able to reclaim some of that street space. Now, we only have some of those slow streets that remain, but in LA, we actually tripled the number of bike lanes uh, that we were able to build in one year compared to the previous years, and we've started to invest in programs like a $16.5 million universal basic mobility program in South LA, where there's going to be a bike share library of 250 e-bikes uh, at the same time as there's going to be um, safe street redesign. So what I'm trying to say is that even in LA, the place where we're known for cars, where we're known for highways, there's momentum. We're starting to do things to make sure that there's inclusive access to subsidized micromobility options. 
that there is protected bike lane infrastructure. And I think the message for this industry that I'm taking away, and especially if we want to see any, any meaningful emissions reductions from micromobility, is that it has to be inclusive by design. The business model, the access to it, everything about it has to be inclusive desi by design. And that's not only because it's the right thing to do, but it's because the more micromobility users you have, the more people you're going to have in favor of bike lanes, the more people you're going to be you know, saying at the city, state, national level that this is something important and to invest in. And really, the key for equitable climate action is going to be micromobility for all. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this last picture right. of uh, uh, someone in East LA uh, riding this e-bike. And I will see you in 10-ish minutes when I'm uh, uh, interviewing Wayne Ting, CEO of Lime. Thanks again.